Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no holds barred truth about being a woman post 40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author, Sam Baker. Ever wanted to chuck it all in? I mean, all of it? My guest today did just that. For 30 years, journalist Lucy Kellaway was a columnist on the Financial Times. Then, in the space of just a couple of years, she ditched not only that, but her home of 15 years her husband of 25, and even her hair, not in that order. In her new book, Reeducated, she talks about the overwhelming urge to remake our lives that often hits in our 40s and 50s, and why she decided to upend her own life, chucking in her enviable, some might say cushy, highly paid job to retrain for one that very much isn't, teaching in an inner London secondary school. I'm free from having to write a sodding weekly column. (laughs) Thank God. And the new things that I've taken on in their place don't yet feel like burdens. They feel like excitements. Over the next 40 minutes, Lucy tells me about her newfound freedom, why fear is one of the most important emotions, how her house became a physical symbol of a marriage that no longer worked for her, and why going grey was possibly the biggest shift of all. And don't get her started on the inequities of internet dating. If you're even slightly tempted to dabble in a bit of life upheaval, Lucy Kellaway is your spirit animal. Let's just go straight into it. What the hell were you thinking? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what the hell was I thinking? Look, I was in a very weird, slightly altered state. My dad had just died and... I guess a whole lot of things that have been simmering away under the surface just came into full focus. And I just thought, yuck, about my journalism life. I just thought, I'm so over this. I don't want to do it anymore. I'd been 32 years. I think actually looking back on it, I was really, really burnt out. And the thought of writing one more column made me feel sort of sick, really. Mm. So that was the sort of immediate thing. But I guess I had been thinking more and more, I want to do something that's actually useful. And being a journalist is not particularly, I mean, it's quite a laugh, especially writing (laughs) sarky columns that I did, but it's really not useful. And I had these two role models. One was my amazing mum who taught at the groovy school that I went to. And the other was my very plucky daughter who had started teaching through Teach First in a really difficult comprehensive school in Leeds. So I was sandwiched between them. So, well, you know, it was always going to happen. And I thought, right now, I'm, you know, I'm in my late 50s. I'm not too old. I'm just bloody well not too old. And I'm going to do it. So I did. So it was the house move that came first, wasn't it? To put it like not um, subtly, it was like ditch the house, ditch the husband as a consequence of ditching the house, then ditch the job. Okay, yeah, all right. So if we are thinking about the whole process of tearing up my life. The house of cards, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) it was the new house that brought the house of cards down. I guess I had just been feeling just really stuck. You know, it's perfectly possible to be in a life that suited you brilliantly at one age to find that it just doesn't suit you anymore. And, you know, I was in a lovely Victorian family house, you know, which was great when the kids were little. But by the time it started to collapse, they were more or less all at university and one even beyond. And the house was a physical symbol, I guess, of a marriage that didn't work for me anymore. You know, David and I, we're still friends. We watched the football together last night. But I don't think either of us wanted to be married to the other person. So if you're living with somebody under those circs, it's actually quite stressful. Or maybe stressful isn't the right word. Maybe it's just a bit sad. But I had thought I was brought up in a family where my parents were very happily married and and they believed you must stick it out. You have children, you have a moral duty to stick it out. And that was very much what I thought and what I was trying to do. And it was, as you say, seeing the advertisement for this beautiful modern house that made me just, well, I went to look at it just on a whim. And when I saw it, I just thought, wow, I would love to live here. And I thought, no, 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 of course I can't. Of course I can't. 
And then actually my son, who had by coincidence been to the house because it had been owned by the by the parents and built by the parents of a friend of his. He'd been there. He went, wow, yeah, that's so cool. And I went, would you like to live there? And he went, yeah. Uh, and, and so I think he understood that the implication of living there would be living there with me and not with me and his dad as well. And I think, you know, they'd all rather seen that coming. And so it's sort of, you know, taking an ax to that structure was actually much easier than I thought it was going to be. Maybe the pulling apart had already happened. Of course, you know, I did wheat buckets as, as the removal fans drew up outside the house. But I'm so fickle, actually, I'd stop crying by the time we arrived. <laughs> it's just stuff, you know. Well, oh, whatever. Just a whole life. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it was that house that started the process of change. And once you've changed one thing, all the other stuff, it's so much easier because you think actually we're not set in this trap that we thought we were. And we really do have some agency in this and we really can change things. It's almost like when people talk about how much easier it is to kill someone the second time. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness, yes. I'm sort of <laughs> Macbeth, absolutely. I mean, so I was actually reflecting on that. I'm four years into teaching now. I've just had my last day at the school that I have been in since I started or pretty much since I started. And I feel sad to leave the kids, but I just think, hey ho, a new challenge. I'm starting in a different school in September. I don't feel that ready to my very being that I felt when I left the FT. That terror of working with new people and, oh, my God, how will I cope? I think, hey-ho, done that one, now let's move on to the next. And it just all seems so easy. And that makes you feel so much lighter. It's brilliant. Which was worst? Which was the most difficult? Leaving the house, the marriage or the job? We'll get onto the hair later. Oh, <laughs> okay. So this sounds ridiculous, but it was the house because a the house was the first change, and as you so correctly say, once you've done one change, the others seem smaller. But it was that the house represented the marriage too. So we were kind of separated living within our big family house. But when you actually say we're selling that, then that feels you're drawing the line under an institution of a family. And that's very, very frightening. But of course, I, you know, I was thinking, am I just throwing my whole family away frivolously? Because I rather fancy the look of this modern house. What an awful thing to be doing. But of course, I haven't thrown my family away. What complete and utter nonsense. There we all were, all of us together watching the football last night. You know, look, our family is full of holes like most other families are, but we're fine. We're all there. Um, hey ho. But yeah, that was the terrifying one. It was financially an unbelievably stupid thing to do. I had paid far more than the house was worth. It had gone to sealed bids in the end. I'd taken half the proceeds of our old house. So I had torched all of my savings. So it was massively financially, not just risky, irresponsible thing to do. So yeah, that was absolutely terrifying. Really, really frightening. I have to say, I've had a snoop on the internet and I can understand falling in love with that house. It's absolutely stunning, isn't it? It's like one of those houses that you're sitting there watching grand designs. And I don't know whether you agree, but I always feel like I sit there going, what the hell are they doing? That's horrible. Or, oh my God, I want to move in there right now. And your house is that house. So I, I really can see it. You know. Yeah. I mean, I sort of feel sheepish about it. I half feel that to be so obsessed with something so trivial makes me a very feeble person morally. And then I'm so aware of my privilege in owning it too. So I did have to think quite hard before inviting my young teacher friends round mm. who are, well, they're younger than my kids, most of them, and they are living in sort of horrible shared houses. And then they come to my splendid place with my 20 foot orange Korean worktop and my goldfish pond and my weird sort of hanging wooden balconies. And they are saying, wow. But I think actually to feel a sort of inverse, inverse snobbery or whatever is wrong. And I think this is the place I happen to live in. I like you as friends, so I will invite you to my house and you can 
can judge it on me as you like. And actually, they're always really sweet. And they go, wow, lucky you. And it's not particularly. Mm. I mean, I imagine that the people listening to this will fall into two camps. And the dominant camp will be, oh, my God, I'm so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> no, the number of women that I speak to who are, you know, in their late 40s or 50s, and they're like done with their long term relationships but still in them, you know, desperate for change. Like you said, the life that they've lived in all that time. And Esther Freud said this a few weeks ago on the podcast, this life used to suit me and it doesn't suit me anymore. And does it make me selfish, you know, leaving it? Maybe. It certainly makes me privileged to be able to. And I think that will be the other camp. There's inevitably going to be another camp who say, well, it's all right for you because you could clearly afford to. You could afford to chuck in your fabulous job and you could afford to buy a fabulous new house, not a pokey little flat because you'd split up with your husband. I am really aware of it. And to everybody in that other camp, who's reaching for the sick bag as I speak. (laughs) Yeah, look, I get it. I do get it. But if I try and think, would this still have been worth it for me if I was moving not into my lucky house, but into a shithole much less nice than the family house I'd left behind? I still think it would have been worth it because if you are in a relationship that you're in for habit, really. It is so limiting. And also the resentment, uh, all of that sort of emotional crap that really holds you down and back. And I mean, obviously, I can't speak for him, but my husband, he's still my husband because I can't see the point of getting divorced. But calling him my husband is very weird because we don't live together and we don't even see each other that often. But I'm not really quite sure what the phraseology is. But I think he would agree that his life is freer and better without me. And that's completely fine. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing, isn't it? That kind of resentment that builds up over time if you let it and it can be caused by a job or, or anything. So I was really interested in the book where you talk about the two factors that drove working at the FT were fear and status. Mm. I so identified with that. When did they kind of relinquish their grip on you? It both happened around the same time. And for me, it was at a about 50. I, at one point, tried to draw a graph of my, because I love the graph. I'm the yeah. <laughs> You're such an economics teacher. I tried to draw a graph of my fear levels. And my fear levels started quite high. And then they went on rising because I kept taking on new challenges at the FT. And each time I thought, oh, my God, I can't write a column. That's terrifying. I can't do this fictional thing. I can't do that. And so I was always ramping up the fear against myself. And then suddenly I noticed at some point in my very early 50s that it wasn't working anymore. And I don't really understand why not. I think maybe it's just that the penny is slow in dropping. What was I actually frightened of? You know, I think I was frightened of being found out. I had an absolutely classic imposter syndrome. But maybe the penny was dropping that if I hadn't been found out, in those nearly 30 years that I've been doing it, it wasn't actually very likely to happen. The thing that I became more afraid of, and this was one of the things that made me feel very burnt out and that just sort of kept me running, was people saying, oh, that Lucy Kellaway, she used to be so good. Oh, yeah. Really gone off. I used to love her, yeah. I used to love her, but what's happened to her recently? And because that was secretly what I felt about myself, that I used to be okay, but actually was now very boring and pedestrian, I was sure that was what other people were thinking too. But that wasn't the same sort of fear. It was That was more a sort of sinking resignation. The sharpness of that fear was something that, looking back on it, I really welcome. And I know we're meant to say that, oh, women feel this more strongly than men, which I think is true, and that it's a really bad thing. I think it's a brilliant thing. And I think mm. the extent to which I was actually good at my job, it was because I was so terrified of not being. And so my male colleagues did a sort of sloppy column very quickly, that will do. And actually, it wasn't that great. I spent ages trying to make every word better. So 
actually what I produced was better than a lot of their work, which they had just sort of tossed off quickly. And so I would advise women to hold on to the fear if they can. So that was a long digression on fear. Status is interesting. I would have denied it at the time. I would have thought, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm a sort of North London girl. I don't, yeah, status, who could even care less. So absolutely that meant nothing to me, I thought. And it was only when I, I started losing it, I realized actually I cared massively. The fact that I worked for the Financial Times, a columnist on the Financial Yes. I adored it when I told people that and their whole faces sort of rearranged themselves from thinking I was some scruffy non-entity to thinking I was really quite someone. And I needed that. I absolutely needed that. And actually, when my mum died in my late 40s, I had my first fantasy about teaching. I think I didn't do it then because I needed the status too much. I was genuinely frightened that if I stopped being this columnist on the Financial Times, people wouldn't like me so much. And they wouldn't. You think they wouldn't? I think they wouldn't on the whole because, well, it may be different than it was being a magazine editor, but I definitely felt like there were people who you thought were your friends who you didn't see for dust when you no longer had that position where maybe you could do something for them. I think then the difference between us was that when I put it to the test, I was 10 years older and yeah. I, I then lost all of those people who thought I could do something for them. Because yeah, I mean, you'd already proved you could, you weren't going to. So They'd all slipped away. And by then I really didn't want to go to parties anyway. What's the point? I'd so much rather sort of go to bed and read a book. So mm. it wasn't exactly Same. a bag of laughs. So the only friends I had were my real friends. And the beauty of your real friends is they don't give a shit whether you're a mm. financial times person or if you're a teacher in a school they absolutely don't care so what i lost i realized i never valued anyway or maybe i did value but no longer valued so yeah there are parties that i don't get invited to but do i want to do that you know i slightly regret maybe not being asked to the chelsea flower show but did i actually enjoy going on those corporate visits to the Chelsea Flower Show when you have to stand there sort of making polite conversation to people. Not particularly. If I want to go to the Chelsea Flower Show that badly, I can blinking well buy myself a ticket. So I don't think I've lost anything. No, it's really interesting, isn't it? But was your identity still wrapped up in being Lucy Kellaway of the Financial Times or had you just totally moved away from that? It was completely wrapped up in that in my late 40s. By my late 50s, because as I said, I was really feeling quite bad about it. So I didn't feel at all impressed that I was Lucy Kellaway from the Financial Times. I felt I'm Lucy Kellaway, old past it on a newspaper that I should have left decades ago. <laughs> and almost sort of disgusted. Maybe that's too strong a word. But no, I was longing to be, let's be a fresher Lucy Kellaway who can blinking well do something else. So I was done when I left. I was absolutely done. So I didn't feel that wrench at all. Oh, so you were totally ready for the thing that you'd been hankering after for a while. Before we talk about teaching, I just want to explore a little bit. You'd moved house, your kids had more or less moved away then your dad died so you weren't a carer for first time in what 25 years probably which so many women will recognize but I was really interested that you managed to write a whole book with no reference whatsoever to the fact that you must have been going through menopause at that point did yeah. it have any impact do you think okay so if it hadn't been for the wonders of modern medicine it would have destroyed my life probably but as it was at some point in my late 40s I never sleep that brilliantly anyway I woke up one night absolutely drenched in sweat I thought oh god here we go I went back to sleep I woke up again 45 minutes later <laughs> in sweat and so it went so I think by the end of that first week I was at the GP saying, this isn't working for me. Give me some HRT. So thanks to HRT, and I, I have actually tried to come off it, but I've had exactly the same thing. It shields you from the menopause. So yeah, thank you, HRT, is all I can say. Yeah, exactly.
Did you feel like you changed at all over that period? A lot of women talk about becoming more self-confident and more able. I want to say put themselves first, but I suppose I do mean that. I think I'm a fundamentally selfish person, but I'm also primarily a carer. So both forces are very strong. I don't feel oh, thank God, now I can put myself first. Exactly. With my children, I mean, I'm not grilling the fish fingers anymore. Their needs are as much the front of my life now as when they were six months old. I remember my mum saying to me when my first baby was born, she was born with something wrong with her feet and she had both legs in plaster when she was sort of two months old. I was living in Germany. I ring mum crying. Mum says something <laughs> really discouraging, like, don't worry. She said, you should enjoy this, she says bitterly, because when <laughs> children are two months old and something goes wrong, you can fix it. When they're in their 30s and something goes wrong, you care just as much, but you can't fix it. I thought, great, thanks, Mum. True, though, isn't it? So true. So I don't feel that I'm this sort of free agent, and I don't want to be a free agent. I want to be needed by my family and by my friends. I love it when they ask something of me. You know, one of my sister's children has got COVID and she said, oh my God, her other son and his girlfriend is meant to be coming. They can't go to their house. Can they come and stay with me? I could think, oh, well, actually it's quite inconvenient for me this weekend. But instead I think no, because doing that family thing is what makes me happy. So I don't really see the two as separable. So how was it being 58 and going right back to the beginning, you know, going from being really senior at the FT to being a trainee who knew nothing? It was very, very shocking. I mean, of course I knew in theory that that's what was going to happen. Indeed, I'd set up this whole charity, Now Teach, mm -hmm. to try and inspire all of these other people to do the same. We sat around, we had meetings saying, now look, it's very important, you corporate lawyers, that you don't walk into the school going, huh, wouldn't run it like this because you've got to learn first, be humble, be humble. So I knew all of that. But I don't think I was prepared for the gut-wrenching horror of being so incompetent because I had defined my life that the things that I'm bad at I deal with them by just not doing them yeah <laughs> I don't even go abroad because my languages are so bad you know I'd never go anywhere where I had to sing or dance or there's so many things I can't do and I just shut them down so I just hadn't had that experience for decades and it's really really astonishing you know the metaphor of stepping into cold water is exactly right stepping into cold water is both very very unpleasant and hugely thrilling and exhilarating because it gives you this shock this jolt of adrenaline and that was what it was like in those early days in the classroom no idea what I was doing screwing everything up can't work the technology can't do this I'm making elementary maths mistakes on the board kids are laughing you know etc and you know you've got to go in and face them again the next day it just braces you to say that I feel alive is a bit corny, but I, yeah, I felt like I was on drugs of the most powerful sort that were both very, very frightening and hugely exhilarating. Oh, I don't know. It's really interesting because the main thing that I was thinking when I was reading the book, I'd be terrified of those kids. I mean, I love the idea of it, but then the reality of standing in front of 32, 15 year olds who wish you'd just shut up was like, oh my God, frightening. It is frightening. It is, but you get over it. I mean, I should also say that I was in, I taught in one of the strictest schools in the country. So the person who was generally in trouble was me, not them. <laughs> so there was no way that anyone was going to throw a table. But they're still 15-year-olds and my God, they can communicate to you if they think you're rubbish. They're completely disengaged. They're sort of reluctant to do what you tell them to. You know, it can still be very, very demoralizing. But I think you do get better. And that is the other thing that, you know, I had stopped improving in what I used to do. I reached a plateau maybe 15 years before I quit. I'm still improving all the time. And as soon as the students become people to you, which happens 
very, very quickly. They're not a class of 32-year-old faces. They are 32 different human beings who you know quite well, and most of whom you're incredibly fond of. Um, yesterday in school was the year 11 prom, and they all turned up in their sort of blancmange wedding dresses. I watched them dance, and I just felt this sort of lovely warm feeling towards all of them and this huge optimism they're starting on their lives and these silly naughty boys all dressed up in their suits it was the most adorable thing I've ever seen and utterly utterly uplifting has your 30 odd years older than your peers has it made any difference to them or to you or yeah. the children yeah okay so someone said oh children don't notice all adults are the same that's absolute rubbish. There was this hilarious time when I was teaching maths and I like to give real examples using words because they find that very difficult, some of the kids. And I had said something like, you know, Paris is 12 and I'm five times as old as Paris. How old am I? And for, for some of these kids, that's a really challenging problem. One of them who's quite weak put up his hand skip the, the calculation altogether and just said, um, 85. Oh, God. <laughs> the Thanks. Kids, <laughs> thanks. So the kids think I'm 85, but I think they think I'm sort of hilarious. And I think they're sort of quite fond of me. But being 85 is fantastic because it means I can talk to them about when the schools shut down from, for us, it wasn't COVID. It was there was not enough coal. In the miners' strike, the schools were too cold and we did our homework by candlelight. And they love all of that. So I think for the kids, my age is good because I've got more stories. But otherwise, whatever, I'm a teacher. Um, for my colleagues, I think it's really brilliant. And it's brilliant for both of us. It's brilliant for me because I've got slightly cooler clothes because I copy them <laughs> slightly. And it's lovely because... Ugh, People in their 20s are sort of more fun than people my age. And we just have a complete scream and we go to the pub together and it's really, really nice. It's such a joy for me. But I think it's good for them too, because I've become an unofficial shop steward and help protect them against sort of vicious senior leaders within the school and say, oh, no, 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 no. You're spending too much time on this. Look, just do that really quickly. Just pretend you've done that. You know, go home now. And, you know, I'm helping them stay alive within a very punishing system. And they watch me have the confidence to stand up to authority. And I think that's really helpful to them. So I say, right, I'm going home now. And they say, but you're not allowed to leave until five. And I say, well, who's going to stop me? I mean, you know, I stayed till seven yesterday. So if I leave 15 minutes earlier, so what today? And I walk out and they're kind of thinking, oh, um, and then some of them come too. So I, I, mean, I never thought I would be this rebel at 62 in the staff room, but that's how it seems to be. And um, yeah, I show them how to write emails to, you know, apply for new jobs and all of those things that are second nature to me because I'm so old and I've survived in the workplace for so long. A, a lot of them, you know, they're 23. They really need help on those things. Things. And so I love giving the help. And yeah, I think they think I'm funny too. Mostly they're laughing at me, but that's fine. Quite a lot of people have said to me that they feel there's this notion that you're automatically likely to be better friends with somebody your own age. And in what way does that make sense? Just because two people are 20 doesn't mean they've got anything else in common other than their age. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, although it is true that if we are talking about me and the teacher's I have nothing in common with them. So I'm older than their parents. I'm very middle class. They're in their 20s. You know, very, very different backgrounds. And I think it's a sort of a mutual enjoyment of that difference that's so lovely. Really, really lovely. But also we've got some things in common. I mean, I was doing a lot of internet dating and one of my 24-year-old maths friends, she was doing a lot too. And so we had that in common. And we used to have massive laughs about the awful men we've been on dates with. And that was just so lovely. It's really, really nice. Yeah, I noticed that you said that when you went grey, one of your friends tried to discourage you because it would be bad for internet dating. Yeah, she just said, not yet. Just don't do it yet because... You know, the age thing is very unfair on women. If you look at all of these profiles of these men who are my age, you know, a lot of them are sort of bald and grey and fat and awful. And they kind of, you know, let's say they put themselves in as 59, which probably means they're 65. 
and they say they're interested in a woman from sort of 40 to 50 and you just think or 35 to 50 yeah. and I just think yuck this is so unfair so my friend's point was that I was finding it hard enough anyway because I was absolutely insistent I had to be honest about my age yeah of course I, I'm so pleased to be the age I am you know why on earth would I pretend to be any other age and she was saying look you know most men wouldn't even look at your profile because you're too old and if then the first thing they see is this gray-haired woman just forget it and uh, you know she was probably right but it made me so angry that I just thought right right (laughs) I'm not having any of this, I'm going to stop dyeing my hair immediately because, you know, if that's how it works, fine, fine, fine. Let them not want me. I I don't care. Um, (laughs) It was in that sort of spirit of, of rage and fury that I went to the hairdresser and had my hair dyed pretty much white before the actual grey white grew in. The only motivation wasn't bloody mindedness, was it? No, it was more of, it doesn't sound too cheesy, it was more feeling much more comfortable with myself. And and it relates to all of the other things about status, about trying to be impressive, about... And I, I just kind of thought, look, this is what I look like. This is who I am. I'm completely fine with it. If you're not, that's your problem. Also, on a more practical way, I didn't think I looked particularly nice with dyed hair. Um, My hair is brown. I've never seen a nice brown hair dye. They're always slightly either carroty or a bit sort of green. It's sort of one or the Mm. other. And because by then I was really very grey, the roots start emerging. It takes so long. It's amazingly expensive. I just sort of thought, look, I'm paying 100 quid a go. I'm touching it up myself horribly badly in between appointments. I don't even look that nice. Sod it. Just not going to do that anymore. But the weird thing is that you asked me earlier which was the most difficult about, you know, leaving marriage, job or home. In a way, the thing that took the most superficial courage was the hair thing because I felt right. I am going from pretending to be sort of, if not young, then very youthful to being the sort of person who people stand up for on the train. And that is quite a hard thing to do. But having done it, yeah, sure, people leap to their feet on the train. They all think that I'm miles older than I am. But actually, I don't mind. I guess it's the way to look at it. It's fine. I mean, I think one of the blessed things about being older is that what's really changed is my own expectations of what I should look like. Um, And I think that's what makes the young so miserable because they have this whole Instagram culture of what they should look like. I don't have that anymore. Um, An FT photographer came to take a picture of me for an article that I'd written about post-lockdown education or something. It was a really hideous picture with terrible lockdown hair. I looked really awful in it. And I looked at the reader's comments and the first one went, Teaching is evidently a towering profession. Look how much older Lucy looks. And, you know, I sort of thought, okay, fine. But I just sort of laughed and thought, yeah, well, I do. And that's just too bad. I, I, you know, I would have found that really upsetting 40 years ago. I probably would have been straight to the Botox clinic. But now I just think, well, my 40s and my 50s were dogged with that fear of looking old. Yeah, I certainly felt like that in my 40s, that I was worried about the fact that I might look in my 40s, whereas now I just don't care. No, and I mean, it's not that I want to look like a complete old bag. I don't. <laughs> don't. You can't see. So I've got really quite a nice little eBay Paul Smith shirt on. My glasses, though they don't look it, were very carefully chosen and really quite expensive. And I've had my hair relatively nicely cut. It's not that I don't care what I look like. It's that I know that in the battle with age, age inevitably wins. That is how it works. <laughs> yeah. So I would like to look nice, but I want to look nice for 62. I don't, I, so I'm not at war with that anymore. And that is such a relief. It's such a relief. 
And there's another thing in this too. It's not just how I look, it's how I feel. Mm. Because as we were saying earlier, teaching is so invigorating. And I spend all of my day talking to people who are either 15 or maybe 25. I wouldn't say it makes me feel young exactly, but it makes me feel invigorated and optimistic and energetic and all of the positive things that we sort of associate with youth. Just before I go to the questions that I always ask at the end, I just want to ask you, what would you advise anyone listening who is feeling, I would love to do that, I would love to teach, or I would just, it's time to do something new? What would you say? Okay, so anyone who'd love to teach, now teach is the website and we will help you. But more seriously, I think you know when it's time. People say to me, don't you wish you had done this earlier? No, I don't. I absolutely don't. I think that these are huge decisions. And then none of them, I mean, apart from the hair, which, you know, is neither here nor there, but you mustn't enter them lightly. And to be aware of what you're losing and to feel fear, which is natural. But my message, I guess, is that wait till there's enough reason to change to get over that fear and be optimistic that there's freedom inside. And that's something that we haven't talked about. Um, You said, were they the most selfish that I've ever been? I would put it differently. I'm the freest I've ever been. And boy, does that feel good. I mean, that is the biggest promise of all, isn't it? How does that freedom manifest? Okay, so what am I free from? I'm free from status. I'm free from people judging me, oh, she's this, she's that, which I guess I have been sort of hamstrung by all my life. I'm free from a marriage that no longer suited me, but we, both of us, got out of it slowly enough that I don't have a whole lot of sort of bitterness on me either, so I'm truly lucky in that. I'm free from my parents, actually, God, I wish they were still alive, but I'm free from my role in caring and worrying about my dad when he was older and I miss him, but that's another freedom. I'm free from grilling those fish fingers. I'm free from having to write a sodding weekly column. (laughs) Thank God. And the new things that I've taken on in their place don't yet feel like burdens. They feel like excitements. That's brilliant. What's your emotional age? Oh my God. I think I'm very weird. I think I've always been a naughty 14 year old adolescent part of me. And then the other part of me has always been about 80 that I just want an early night. So it's somewhere between the two, not much in the middle. So I've been one, one of my natural ages and I'm working towards the other. Um, Can you recommend a book, either something that you've just read recently that you've loved or yeah, you know, a book that you keep going back to or keep buying people and not an economics book. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> no school books here. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I've just read one of the classics, which I read lots of the classics when I was a child. It's by Elizabeth Gaskell. It's Wives and Daughters. It is brilliant. Um, she does die before she's finished it, but she sets it up so well that doesn't even matter. I came upon it a, a couple of months ago and read it and I thought, wow. So I will return to that again. Brilliant. What one piece of advice would you give younger women? Easy. There is so much time. And younger women who feel that, you know, they're not in the perfect relationship, that they're not in the perfect job. I want to say to them, look at me, you know, I'm still grappling with those things and I'm 62. The only way in which young women are running out of time is biologically. But thanks again to medicine, we can push that one out a little bit further than before in terms of having babies. But don't feel that there's a desperate dash because you can afford to get it wrong loads of time and still end up somewhere good. I think that's so interesting, isn't it? Because there's so much pressure on us to get it right first time. Who is your old bird role model? Oh, God, I've got to be boring here. It's my mum. I followed her everything, but just way late. She went grey at 50. I spent the first five and a half decades of my life trying to be as unlike mum as possible. Now, everything I do is becoming more like mum. And bring it on, frankly, she was totally terrific. Brilliant. What's your superpower? Well, I mean, I'm not invisible. You can see me. Yeah, you're absolutely not invisible. I certainly can't fly. I can ride a bicycle. No, look, I'm going to be really mean. I'm too prosaic for superpowers. Okay. Power is just to be 
to be very literal minded. <laughs> yes, yes, clearly. Um, and lastly, how many fucks do you give? Oh, God, that's such a difficult question. In some ways, I don't give a single fuck, but you don't want to live your life like that. It's so important to give loads at the same time. How many fucks do I give about my children? Infinity, infinity. About my students, a lot about them too. About everybody I care about, masses. Yeah, do I give a fuck whether people like me? I don't want them to think I'm horrible, but if they don't particularly like me, then I give zero. Absolutely zero. So it's a mixed bag. So some of on some registers I'm falling, but on others I give just as many as I always had. Horrible, complicated answer, but that's the truth. No, that's that's good. Honestly, so many people start off saying none or very few, and then they start adding them in. Yeah. So, oh, but there's this one and there's that one, and then of course you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant, Lucy. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a pleasure. Really great. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review, and follow, because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to know more about my own experience of shifting, my book, The Shift, How I Lost and Found Myself After 40, and You Can Too, is out now in paperback. See you next time. See you next time.